Greetings fellow time travellers, as always it's lovely to have you alongside for the trip. Goodness me, uh, this, uh, might as well make a note for history, uh, is a week in which UK politics have gone even more bonkers than they often are. Uh, they have perhaps reached peak bonkers, but there's no way of knowing. Um, oh, it's all this nonsense, you know, Liz Truss came in, then Liz Truss got flushed down the toilet 44 days later, uh, and now there's been a coup, <laughs> but for want of any other word, uh, we Rishi Sunak in his tiny, tiny suit. And uh, well, who else? Jeremy Hunt. Don't get me started. The rest of them. So it's desperate states. We've, we've, been, we've been kind of subjected to a political coup. And, uh, and the nonsense just keeps on coming. And it's at moments like these that you, me, and the rest of our community takes a breath to consider history. Uh, we wonder if these things have happened before. And if they have happened before, which they invariably have, how did the poor souls dealing with them then... Uh, managed to get through whatever maelstrom they found themselves among. Just before we begin this week's episode, though, I want to say thanks to all the people who show support for the podcast series, all of it in its entirety, by subscribing to my Patreon.com site. Uh, it's your help, uh, financial, make no bones about it, that makes the love letters possible, so thank you. If you're not a member yet and you'd like to support the podcast, just go to Patreon.com, look for me by name, part with some money. Uh, you can do it monthly, or if you go for the year, it's cheaper. Uh, you become a member of a community, a family. There's weekly vodcasts, uh, one of which is a question and answer uh, hour with me. Uh, it'd be great to have you as part of the family, so do join. Right, now it's time to strap yourselves into the time machine as we set off for the next stop on my love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. What though every hill and dale echoes now with war's alarms, Celtic hearts can never quail when Cambria calls to arms. In this podcast, we're stepping into a maelstrom and the last stand of the brave. Beautiful and brilliantly designed, in this mighty coastal fortress, a castle within a castle. Built as part of Edward I's Ring of Steel, the last sovereign Prince of Wales, crushed. Wars of Welsh independence, wars of the Roses and the English Civil War. Down through history, this place has been a place of heroes facing overwhelming odds. A thorn in the side of so many would-be conquerors. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me, and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver, and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Hi Neil. Last week, your journey took us to the middle of the brutal Wars of the Roses, to stand beside the tomb of the mother whose child ended the feud. Where are we now? We're in a castle. A castle that stirs my imagination, that stirs everyone's imagination, surely. It's all about determination, courage and heroism. It's a place that's played a part in so much of the history that has shaped this archipelago. Looking out over the Irish Sea on one side and the mountains of Snowdonia on another, we're in Gwynedd at the mighty Harlech Castle. Oh, it's another, it's another favourite of mine, for all sorts of reasons. It's Harlech Castle. I love castles. I think I've probably made that quite clear. And Harlech is about as castly as it gets. <laughs> if you like a stone castle, you know, Harlech is like the template. Nobody ever did it better It's sort of in structural, architectural terms. But we'll get to the castle itself in a minute. What this one is, the reason why it's part of the love letter to the British Isles, is because for me, Harlech almost like no other place, is a classic example of the power of the myth. Now, we talk about myth all the time in the, in the love letter, but there's something very almost concrete at Harlech, appropriately enough. Myths happen where, I've said it before, I said it about Glastonbury, where there's almost certainly, there is, there's certainly been something true, and it matters to people, 
and they remember it. But as the years go by and the years turn into decades and decades into centuries, by the process of Chinese whispers, things get muddled and it evolves over time. And obviously audiences are different. And, and what pleased an audience 100 years before might not please an audience now. And it, things get modified. And what you end up with eventually in, in all myths is a blending of fact and fiction, the truth and something else. To go off on a tangent, you might think, but it's not really. My interest in history comes from various sources. My interest in my grandfather's experiences in the First World War, that was key. But another one, believe it or believe it not, is the 1964 film Zulu. <laughs> right. On the cinema posters, it's actually Zulu with an exclamation mark. It's like shouted, Zulu! And... I saw it. My dad made me watch it. Didn't make me watch it. It was on one Saturday afternoon on the telly when I was, oh, heaven knows, six or seven years old. And I sat and watched it with my dad and I was just transfixed. And anyone that has seen it, and that'll be a lot of people listening, will have seen Zulu. And if they haven't, I strongly recommend that you find it and watch it. It's just one of those ones that for me and for a lot of people, it's, it's in the short list of best films ever made. Sometimes equaled never better, that kind of thing. And it tells a story based on fact. During the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879, there was a catastrophic battle called Isandalawana, where a British contingent of about 1,500 men was all but wiped out by a Zulu army, many times larger than itself, that had snuck up on it and, and sort of out-tacticked and out-fought it on the day. And in the afternoon and evening of the same day, some of those Zulus sought out a supply station, a British supply station called Rourke's Drift, that was the base for about 150, 100, 150 British and colonial soldiers. And they really just went over to make some trouble, wipe it out, because it was about 4,000 Zulus that came against the 100, 150. But against all the odds, those 150 defenders fought them off. through the afternoon and through the night that followed. And eventually, the Zulus just turned and, and left. It was, it was too difficult. It wasn't worth their while. They were taking too big a hit and there wasn't much in it for them anyway. So they, they withdrew. And just like today, the British authorities, the British government, they were all about PR. You know, what they talk about, what they call the optics, how things look. They didn't want people focusing too much on the fact that a British army had been wiped out by warriors with spears and shields. It didn't look good. So they glossed over that and bigged up the defence of Rourke's Drift. It was like, don't mind, don't, don't look over there, look here, where some of our British soldiers did something spectacularly wonderful and they, and they held the line against overwhelming odds. And to add further polish to it all, Queen Victoria awarded 11 Victoria Crosses to the defenders of Rourke's Drift, the most at one time ever given. There's no doubting the defence of Rourke's Drift was spectacularly brave, but it also played into the government's hands. On a day of very, very bad news, they were the bit of good news. And so it was played up. So there's, there's fact that at the root of the film Zulu. However, it was enormously embellished and played around with. It was very much the work of the actor, the Welsh actor, Stanley Baker, who was a staunch Welshman, Welsh nationalist, and loved the fact that there had been Welshmen as part of the, the defence of Rochdrift. And in the film Zulu, they're all Welsh. Really, it's all Welsh accents. And one of the moments that everyone who's seen the film remembers is when the, the Zulu are chanting. They're singing this big anthem, this big threatening song as they prepare another charge, another attack on the place. And it's working its magic in that the soldiers are quaking in their boots. And so Stanley Baker plays the part of a character called, a real figure called John Rouse Marriott Chard, who was the officer commanding at Rourke's Drift. And he turns to one Private Owen, who in the film is played by the Welsh tenor Ivor Emmanuel. 
And he says to him something along the lines of, can't the Welsh sing any better than that? And Private Owen listens to the music and says, well, they've a very good bass section for sure, but they've got no top tenors. <laughs> Pardon my accent there. And, and he, he clears his throat and starts to sing. Ivor Emmanuel, the legend that is Ivor Emmanuel, starts to sing. And what he sings is the song, Men of Harlech. Men of Harlech, stand ye steady. It may not be ever said he. It's just, it, it puts the hairs up in the back of my neck and makes me want to cry every time I think about it. And of course, they can all sing. So they all sing Men of Harlech. And there's this kind of, there's this kind of sing-off between the Welshmen and the Zulus. And, the, and the, this, well, this Welsh song rings out across the African veldt, and it's a fantastic moment, and, you know, it, and it girds their loins and it, and it prepares them to, to continue with their doughty defence, which is ultimately successful. Now, it's brilliant filmmaking, but it's myth-making. And I'll tell you for why. It's because the real defenders of Rourke's Drift in 1879 were the 24th Regiment of Foot, that was the body of men from whom their little contingent was drawn. And the majority of them in 1879 were English. They had been recruited from the Midlands of England, in large part. And there were Welshmen there. Maybe 10, 15% of them were Welsh. But there were Scots and Irish too. So it was very much a sort of United Kingdom British force. So that's problem number one. They weren't all Welshmen, not by any stretch of the imagination. Furthermore, there is no record whatsoever of anybody singing during the defence of Rorke's Drift. They did not put down their rifles and sing. And even if they had, the regimental song of the 24th Regiment of Foot at that time was not Men of Harlech, it was The Warwickshire Lad which is a much less memorable tune that no one sings now. So in the same way that when I talked about Glastonbury and I talked about how I was the warm-up act for you 2 well, Stanley Baker does something along the same lines with the film Zulu. He takes a little bit of truth and spins it into something wonderful and something that stirs the hearts. It's just, it's, it plucks all the strings it's powerful stuff, but it, it, it's not the truth. So that's myth-making. And it's myth-making at its very best. And it's spine-tingling and it raises the hackles. Now, the thing about Men of Harlech is Men of Harlech does actually commemorate a last stand. It is a song that's inspired by a last stand by the few against the many. But in truth, it commemorates a siege during the Wars of the Roses, which we've also talked about already in the context of Westminster Abbey. Now, Carlach Castle, we finally get... This is, this is often the case, the way we do these things. We finally, we finally get to the place. So, Carlach Castle is, was, will always be a clenched fist of a place. As I said at the beginning, it's a castle amongst castles. It's just special. It was built between 1283 and 1285, and it was commissioned by Edward I of England, that king that keeps on cropping up. Edward I, Edward the Longshanks, Edward that fought William Wallace, Edward that was so annoyed about the wars of Scottish independence. Him, because he wasn't just annoyed about the behaviour of Scottish people, he was angry about Welsh people as well. And a character from Welsh history, Llewellyn ap Gruffydd, was the last sovereign Prince of Wales, you know, before the likes of Prince Charles took on the title. Llewellyn ap Gruffydd, he had defied Edward, challenged Edward. Edward had him down as one of his liegemen, someone that was supposed to be submissive to him, and Llewellyn had defied him, and he'd paid for it with his life. And Edward was so angry, he, he was always terribly angry about defiance, Edward. And so he punished Gwyneth, which was the county at the heart of the rebellion. And he took away the royal insignia, took it for his own. And th there had also been a fragment of the true cross, which is to say the cross that Jesus Christ was crucified upon. It was a relic, 
Now, whether it really was a fragment of the True Cross, well, is neither here nor there. It had been held and revered in, in Gwynedd for the longest time, and Edward took that away as well, all really just to humiliate. And more practically, he decided to create a, a kind of a ring of steel of castles so that his garrisons, his English garrisons, would be protected so that he could keep men on station and they would be protected. And, and Harlech was one of these, the best of them. And it's built on the coast uh, in Merionethshire. And it was the work of a genius called James of St George. He was the master of the king's works at the time. And he's gone down in legend almost as a, a, a military engineer of, of unsurpassed genius and ingenuity. And what he did with Harlech was he created a castle within a castle. There's outer walls which are defensive enough, massive, and then inside it there's a castle again. So it's this castle within a castle for superb strength. And it sits on an outcrop of rock, on a natural outcrop of rock, as these castles so often did. Even by 21st century standards, it looks impregnable. It looks like something that you'd have to bring a battleship in to, to deal with. Uh, so mighty is it. The walls, you know, you're talking stone walls uniformly a dozen feet thick and more. The East Gate is almost absurdly defended. It's all, it almost makes you laugh, the lengths that he's gone to to make it impregnable. And best of all, at Harlech, there's a flight of steps, 200 feet in height, that goes down from the castle and goes down to the to the sea. Well, when it was built, it went down to the sea and it meant that if Harlech was besieged on land, ships could continue to supply it. So an English army inside Harlech Castle, although, although they maybe had an enemy out front, they could bring in supplies by sea. F funnily enough, when you go there today, the sea level has, has dropped. So now the water gate, as it stands, is way above sea level. It makes Harlech look like a kind of a rock pool, you know, left behind by a tide that, that may or may not ever come back. But it's just the most extraordinarily defended place. The defences, they were tested for the first time in 1294. And at that time, there was a character called Mad Dog at Llewellyn, who was a, a relative of Llewellyn, the last sovereign prince of Wales. And he raised an army in rebellion to rise up against the, the English overlords. And he laid siege to a number of castles, including Crickier and Aberystwyth. Uh, but he also uh, went after Harlech. Nonetheless, the, the garrison, the English garrison within Harlech were able to hold them off because the defences of uh, James of St George were more than up to the job. It was attacked again. There was another Welsh legendary figure called Owen Glendour. He styled himself Prince of Wales. And he, like Mad Dog before him, in the first decade of the 15th century, he had a go at Harlech Castle and elsewhere. And he was successful. He managed to evict the English garrison and he set up home in Harlech. He held a parliament there in 1405. But Edward came back. Edward wouldn't let it lie, as you can imagine. And he regained, Edward regained the castle late 1408 or early 1409. And so it was back in English hands. So there's this long back and forth of Harlech being besieged, you know, sometimes successfully, mostly not. But then, during the Wars of the Roses, there's this siege, and it's this siege during the Wars of the Roses that gives rise to the song Men of Harlech. The Wars of the Roses were fought between the House of York and the House of Lancaster, parts of the Plantagenet family that fought with one another for years to try and gain and keep control of the English throne. And on the 10th of July 1460, there was a battle at Northampton, and the Yorkist side was victorious. And the leader of the Lancastrian, the defeated force that day, was Margaret of Anjou, who was the queen, the wife of the Lancastrian Henry VI. And she and her defeated army made a run for it. They left the battlefield and they, they fled all the way to Harlech Castle. So that was in 1460. And for the best part of the next eight years, they were besieged in there. But they held out and they held out and they held out. And, but then finally, 1468, eight years later, the Yorkist king, Edward IV, he brought maybe 10,000 soldiers to the gates of Harlech. 
and he managed to throttle the life out of the home team. He cut them off. Even the water gate, even the access to the sea wasn't enough. And they were starved into submission. And it was that defence, unsuccessful though it was, that was subsequently remembered. The song wasn't written at that time. It was written later. But Men of Harlech remembers those Lancastrians in their years of defiance. You know, you've got March ye men of Harlech bold, unfurl your banners in the field. Be brave as were your sires of old, and like them never yield. What though every hill and dale echoes now with war's alarms, Celtic hearts can never quail when Cambria calls to arms. It's fantastic stuff. And there's no doubting Rourke's Drift, Harlech, Last Stands have always been the stuff of legend because they're terrifying to contemplate. Those situations that, you know, I'm sure many people have daydreamed or imagined what it might be like to realise that, you know, your back's against the wall now and the choice is stark. You know, stand up and fight or, or get down on your knees and beg for your life. But it's for that reason, I think it's because of the binary simplicity of a last stand that people have long made myth and legends of them. And obviously, Rourke's Drift, you know, is a classic of the kind. The words of Men of Harlech were composed before the music that's now familiar to people who've seen the film Zulu. It first appeared in print in a collection of songs called Gems of Welsh Melody in 1860. So there was a long process of evolution Clearly, given that the siege was between 1460 and 1468, it wasn't until 1860 that the words and the familiar music were actually published. And so, you know, you go to the castle today, you climb to the castle's tallest tower, and you look out over the Irish Sea as it is, or or you can turn the other way and look out over the town and and across to the mountains of Snowdonia, and it catalyses what so many people think about when they think about Welsh legend. There's just a sense of everything that you that you associate with Welsh legend is there in Harlech Castle. Although it was built by an English king, there's just some way in which it seems to put the hairs up on, on, the, on the back of the neck. When you come in from the land, you walk under th- not one but three portcullises. Three portcullises before you get inside the interior of the castle. And when you do that, if you make the trip, if you go to Harlech and you walk through those gates, you have demonstrated in unavoidable terms what it means to be a conqueror and conversely what it means to stand in the face of a conqueror and fight to the last man. was built, the castle's defences were cutting-edge technology, and they remained that way for hundreds of years. That's right. I mean, we're used to technology moving on very quickly, and, you know, things becoming obsolete within a matter of years, you know, sometimes even within a matter of months, you know, something's invented and then you can almost hold your breath until the next thing comes along. But in the past, technology took a lot longer to develop, and so the defences of the sort that were masterminded by James of St George at Harlech in the 13th century, they continued to be relevant and to be up to the job of defending people for hundreds of years. Until the advent of heavy artillery, you cannon fire, there was really nothing you could do in the face of castle walls. If you were behind the closed portcullis and gates of a place like Harlech, with a water gate to your rear that meant that you could be supplied from the sea. Even if an attacker brought 10,000 men to the gates, to the walls, even if there were only a few hundred people inside, if they could keep themselves supplied with food and water, there was precious little that attackers could do. What are you going to do? You know, you've got bows and arrows and crossbows against masonry that's 12 feet thick and many tens of feet high. And when it comes to a siege, the advantage is always with the defenders, even when they're terribly outnumbered. They have nowhere to go. You know, for good or ill, they're on home soil. 
They can't run for it. Where are they going to go? The challenge is for the aggressor outside. And from the minute they arrive and set up camp, those soldiers are thinking about going home. They just want it to be over. And so the challenge is to keep those men supplied and to keep them motivated to persuade them to stay put because every night it gets dark and a few more of them might drip away like grains of sand or water through your cupped fingers. They just drift away. So it's a massive challenge. So even if the besieging force massively outnumbers the people behind the walls, they can't get in. The most they can hope to do is choke them off from supplies. But in the case of a place like Harlech, where they could be supplied from the water, that means as well as besieging on land, you've got to bring a navy. You've got to bring boats to try and take control of the sea as well to prevent ships supplying the besieged force. So when you add into that mix defences like those at Harlech, if people can just stand firm, which they did again and again and again, the advantage is always with them. And that's why, in many instances, the people trapped behind the walls of Harlech Castle, if they waited it out, <laughs> eventually the besieging force would just get so demoralised they would just go away. It took a very determined would-be conqueror indeed to tough it out at a place like Harlech, which is why it was achieved by people like Edward I and Edward IV, men of legendary intent, of legendary aggression and stubbornness. Anybody half-hearted is going to be broken against the walls of Harlech Castle. What happened when Oliver Cromwell attacked Harlech? Oliver Cromwell's, uh, you know, taking of the place is almost a footnote. 1647, because by that time the technology had come on. Harlech was outdated and outmoded by that time, because obviously by the time of Cromwell, you do have guns. Masonry is fantastic against bows and arrows and crossbow bolts. They just bounce off. But they're spectacularly ineffective against gunpowder and cannonballs because stone masonry just shatters and explodes when you fire a cannonball at it. The next evolution was earthen defences. Banked earth is much more effective against cannonballs because the cannonballs just go into it and embed. So you just lose your cannonball <laughs> without doing a great deal of damage. So heaped soil, great banks of earth are much more effective than masonry. Masonry is not effective against heavy artillery which by the 17th century was what was being brought to bear on defences like that. So having been the best mode of defending people and property for hundreds of years, the castles had finally had their day. And by the time of, of an aggressor like Oliver Cromwell, they had just been overtaken by time. Are there examples of 17th century earthen defences in the British Isles? Well, Paul, you and I, when we did the siege of Newark for two men in a trench, the gun emplacements there were defended not by stone walls, but by earthen ramparts. For that reason. During the siege of Constantinople, for example, in 1453, the walls of, of Theodosius protected the city of Constantinople for a thousand years. Great stone walls, multi as they're called, walls within walls within walls. And the ancient world had sort of taken them for granted. It was like a, it was like a mountain range, the wall of Theodosius. You just knew you weren't going to get through it. And besieging armies, uh, Arabs and others, came and tried it and, you know, just were starved and, and fell apart and, and had to withdraw. But then finally in 1453, the Ottoman Sultan Mehmet II came with massive guns great bronze cannons, big enough that a man could crouch inside the, the mouths of some of them. And they were launching great stone balls. And the, the walls of Constantinople shattered on impact. It was devastating for the people inside. They couldn't believe it. How on earth was this happening? And the defence, the emergency stopgap solution, turned out to be the perfect remedy. What the defenders within Constantinople started to do was, was heap soil into the gaps that the cannonballs were making. Then when cannonballs were then fired against the heaped earth, they just impacted, just got absorbed by the soil. 
And so almost by accident, the defenders at Constantinople found the perfect defence. So where the walls were shattering and were replaced with heaped soil, they worked. And although it looked for to begin with that it was going to be heavy artillery that was going to make the difference during that siege of Constantinople, ultimately it was down to a gate being left open. One of the gates was left open, possibly by a traitor, and some of the Ottoman army were able to get inside and it, and it, it triggered a, a kind of a toppling of dominoes and the city fell. But by that time, the defenders had found the solution to Mehmet's cannons and it was heaped earth. When you visit and stand on the castle's ramparts, does that song, the men of Harlech, always come to mind? Oh, oh goodness me. Yes, absolutely. It's probably a generational thing. Anyone that thinks of the film Zulu that's, that's of a certain age, as much as anything else, it's that scene and that song that they remember. It's, it's Ivor Emmanuel, first of all, as a solo, starting to sing Men of Harlech, and then his Welsh brethren join in with him. And it, and it becomes this, this overwhelming anthem that stands in defiance of what the 4,000 Zulus are singing in their great rolling bass voices. That moment is immortal. That moment of, of those Welshmen singing Men of Harlech at Rourke's Drift is, is as immortal as any other moment from any other legend. In 1548, a cry for help was answered, and to this very day it's still needed and still given. Male graves that have caught and consumed many, frighteningly strong and irresistible. A breathtaking landscape playing its part in history and reminding us of our temporary nature in the face of the all-powerful elements. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles, Check out Neil Oliver Love Letter, the podcast's Instagram account. And to ensure you get each new episode of the podcast as it goes live, don't forget to subscribe, write a review and share with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. The social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production by Althorpe Studios. And the graphics by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who've made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production. <laughs>